You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have CJ Tudor on the show with me today. She has a book called The Other People that is now available in trade paperback, um, you know, so you don't have to mortgage your home to to buy a, a full-size copy of, of The Other People. It's an amazing book. Um, CJ, you have an amazing catalog, and I can't wait to talk with you. Uh, welcome to the show today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Excuse me for being a little bit croaky. I'm at the tail end of a really rotten cold, so I have my kind of um, uh, my croaky, well, not very sexy voice. On the <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> here, here in the states where I am, um, down south, we're we're getting the first um, little glimpses of fall in in uh, uh, days in the seventies and the nights dipping uh-huh. down a little cooler. And what's it like where you are? <laughs> it's absolutely hammering it down with rain here in the UK <laughs> right now. It's thoroughly, thoroughly grey and miserable. <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, I, I, you know the UK in autumn and winter and most. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, CJ, um, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is: What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, crumbs! My first memory of actually properly trying to like put together stories and little books it must have been when I was probably about six or seven or so I had these younger cousins who quite possibly couldn't read actually but I remember writing them little little stories and making them into little books and I remember writing one about this this elf um and I, I drew the pictures and I stuck it all together so it was a proper little book um and I remember just being really thrilled that I sort of made this this little book. But I think I was always kind of making up stories in my head because, <laughs> excuse me, I was an only child. And I, I used to live in like a total fantasy world a lot of the time. My brain was constantly, you know, every day I would make up this little world that I was living in, whether I was, I don't know, a princess or something living in a castle or I was a, a dog or, you know, I, I, I totally inhabited these fantasy worlds that I would make up every day and I would go about my little life and my day in this fantasy world. So I think I was constantly making up stories, really. I love that. Uh, there, There's something uh, magical about when you as a kid um, realize that books are something you could make. Um, because I think in, in everyone's mind, when you go to a bookstore or a library and you see just these rows and rows of books, there's a there's a certain point in your life where you just kind of assume that books always are, always have been. Yeah. And then there's a moment of realization when you realize someone created these things. Someone wrote the story. They imagined it. And then someone else bound it together and, you know, did all of the work of publishing. But th- these were actual people that made these. And and then when you can make that leap from someone made this to I can make this. That that's an enchanting moment. It is, and it's that strange thing that you you suddenly realise when you start to write um, that you can create all these wonderful fantasies and worlds and boundless possibilities. You can do whatever you want. You are completely in control. And I think as a as a child, that's quite an exciting thing as well. You know, as a child, because you're constantly being controlled and told what to do. Right. But if you start writing yourself. You have this whole world, and you can make up characters and, and things, or put yourself in these stories. And you're completely in control of it. And that's quite an amazing thing, I think, as well, when you're a child. And that, I think that was what excited me as well when I sort of started writing. Um, so just, you know, I could, I could put all these, these stories on, on, on sort of paper and pen and put them together. And, and it was all mine, you know. I had complete control of them. I was a god of all my little <laughs> stories in the world. I read somewhere, um, CJ, that you said 
that while everyone else your age was reading Judy Bloom, you were reading Stephen King. Uh, what what is it about the the darker side of life that fascinates you? I don't know. It's weird, isn't it? Because my parents are completely normal, and they 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 don't like reading <laughs> at all. Um, but I was always really completely normal. Carb, even from a really young age, and, and it's hard to say. Well, I think a lot of kids are quite macabre. Um, I think that's just in children, you know, that that wanting to, I see it in my own little girl who's seven now, you know, we found a dead squirrel the other day and, and she was just like, oh, poke it. Can we poke it, mummy? Can we poke it? Is it dead? What's going to happen to it when you bury it? They, they are, I think there is a fascination with that as a child. And I, I remember that as well. And then from quite a young age, I was reading like ghost stories and Hamlin's true ghost stories and all that sort of thing. And then very quickly, that sort of, sort of progress to Stephen King. Because, of course, because I'm very, very old, <laughs> I'm 48. <laughs> um, there wasn't so one am I. when I was a kid. Yeah, so you know what I mean? So you did go straight from kind of kids' books. Like, obviously, I, I sort of went Enid Blight, and I loved Enid Blight and when I was younger. But then I think that age when a lot of kids were, I think Judy Bloom was the closest kind of thing you had to YA kind of then. Yeah. That transition from proper children's books to adults. Um, but... <laughs> very quickly that didn't cater for my kind of desire for dark kind of mystery so yeah I started doing things like Agatha Christie and I'd get these books from the library and then one day picked up a Stephen King book and then that was it for me I was just completely enthralled it was like oh, wow this is what I want to read and this is what I want to write so and that was probably about 11 or 12 I think yeah when you when you talk about um, Agatha Christie, you know, I, I'm just remembering as you're talking to when I was a youngster in school and I remember there was there was always a girl uh, who was reading things that were way past our age level. And she was always, you know, reading Agatha Christie or things like that. And and we just assumed that she was the genius of, of the group, um, you know, and uh it, it's it's interesting. Well, it's interesting when you when you put it that way because um, there's something mature and um, I, I don't want to say smarter than the rest, but but kind of yeah, it's smarter. But when when you realize that these kinds of stories um, uh, entertain you or that, that you want to live in the world of mystery, there's there is something kind of more mature uh, about those stories as a child. I guess, yeah. And I suppose like there's that, that desire as a child to always have things that perhaps you're not supposed to have. Right. So, you know, as, as a kid getting into the, you know, the adult, so to speak, section of the library and being able to pick up grown up books. I think I probably used my dad's library card, I think, um, is quite exciting. And particularly when I was a kid um, in the 80s, horror was really, really big then. Of course, you have Stephen King and James Herbert and Dean Coombe, Clive Barker, and it was a very popular genre. So you'd go into a lot of the, the stores and you'd see these very garish kind of horror covers with, you know, right. I remember James Herbert one the fog with this hand holding this decapitated head. <laughs> really quite brutal and gory. And as a child, of course, you're like, I want to read that because I feel like I shouldn't be able to read that, you know. So I think there is also that kind of like wanting to read things you're not supposed to. And of course, right. adult books have adult themes and they have swear words. Uh, you know, sometimes they have sex and so on in it. And so I think there is that kind of lure of the the forbidden too. But at the same point, I think, you know, if you love reading, um, moving on to more adult material, I think, again, it challenges you in, in ways as well. You know, emotionally, it challenges you with what you're reading and in terms of language and everything else. So, you know, I think it, it, it was, you know, for me, it was it was a great thing. And I I kind of learned everything I know about writing, I think, from reading because I never went to college or university I didn't do any writing courses so really I I you know my reading and getting into sort of reading more grown-up books when I was quite young I think is, is what has taught me how to write really so from from that young age of creating stories and binding them for for your young audience um was there ever an adult who recognized this storytelling gene in you and offered any encouragement along the way Yes. I mean, I had um, the mother was teacher when I was at junior school with Miss Wilkinson, who was lovely. And she used to really encourage me. I used to write poems and things then as well. And she was lovely and really encouraged me. Um, and then when I was at senior school, I had a couple of great English teachers. But I always remember Mr. Webster um, was my English teacher in, in senior school um, in the UK. 
So from about when I was probably about 12 to, to 16. Um, and he really used to encourage me. And he used to lend me books, sort of classic ghost stories and, and, and gothic books and, and lots of you know, classic dark mysteries and things because he knew that was what I loved. Um, and I always remember one of my essays he once wrote, um, if you do not go on to become prime minister or a best-selling author, I will be very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, the that's minister. the best encouragement. <laughs> But, you know, it, it took me it took me quite a long time. But, you know, I, I, I'm an author at last. So I like to so, be proud eventually. So from from those times where you knew that you were going to be an author, or there was a desire in you um, to having um, the Chalk Man, which was your first book, having it published. What what was the intervening time like? And, and when did you realize that this was something you were going to pursue, whether you know, whether it worked out or not, this was something you were going to work toward. It was a long, long time. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I loved writing as, as a teenager, but then I left school and I kind of didn't write for quite a long while. Um, I had a variety of jobs. Um, and then in my 20s, I think I you know, went through that thing a lot of people in their 20s go through of like, you know, bad relationships, uh, perhaps going out and having fun and just being generally irresponsible and not really settling down to anything in particular. And it probably wasn't until I was in my early 30s that I sort of started writing properly again with an idea of wanting to get back into it and wanting to do something with it. It was sort of always there, but it wasn't, you know, I'd start things and then put them aside and not really knuckle down to it. Um, but in my 30s, I thought, you know, if, I, if you know, I've always wanted to write. My jobs, you know, on and off had involved writing. I'd worked in radio, writing commercials and so on and so forth. And um, you know, I was a agency and I'd, I'd sort of been in writing loosely, but the whole book writing thing, I'd always, I, I think part of me always felt it was a bit beyond me. I wasn't sure if I had the endurance to sit down and actually write a book without getting bored or distracted or something. So I kind of set myself a task if I would get from the beginning to the end of a book and just finish something, whatever it was like, even if it was awful, I would just finish something. Um, and that's kind of what I did. And it was awful. But I proved to myself that I could get to the end of a book, which was always the challenge with me. I had lots of ideas and I could never really see it through. And once I knew I had the discipline to write, you know, 400, 500 odd pages, then that made quite a difference. I sort of went about the next task of like writing something good <laughs> with kind of the belief <laughs> that I could do it. Um, but I, I had a lot of false starts. I, you know, I had an agent at one point in my 30s with about, I think, the third book that I wrote. Um, but then that didn't work out. And I kind of thought that was, uh, but they really wanted me to write what I call straight crime, crime procedural. Um, and therefore they tried to take all the more, <coughs> excuse me, creepy or supernatural aspects out of my writing. But that was what I really wanted to do. So we kind of, you know, battled back and forth for, I think it was two years over a manuscript. And then it didn't get me a publisher. And I eventually kind of thought I'm really miserable. And I decided to leave that agent, which at the time felt a really kind of, well, either brave or stupid thing to do. Um, and it was a long while before I you know, got another agent. But ultimately, I think it was the right thing to do because, you know, what's what's the point of trying to write stuff that isn't you or, you know, that you're not happy, happy doing? So you have to kind of have a little bit of integrity perhaps with your writing. Do you want to get paid to write stories? Do you enjoy collaborating with other talented storytellers? Do you want to work completely remotely and set your own hours? Relay Publishing is looking for writers and editors to work on fiction projects across a range of genres, from thrillers to sci-fi, fantasy, and romance. The Relay process is extremely collaborative, in the same vein as a TV show's writer's room. If you're a story geek, then you'll be on a great team. There are seven ghost writing positions and 10 editing positions currently available. Please go to www.recruitment.relaypub.com. That's www.recruitment.relaypub.com for more information on how to apply. Join a great storytelling team today. Papyrus Author was designed and developed with the modern writer's needs, wishes, and preferences in mind. From big structures right down to tiny details, every single feature of our software has been carefully and meticulously crafted in collaboration with authors. 
take charge of your writing with the author interface, which gives you access to different elements of your story, such as characters, backgrounds, and narrative structure. Move sections of your writing seamlessly in the navigator and evaluate the complexity of your text with our expert style and readability analysis. Never worry about losing progress with automated backups. With Papyrus Author, you can be your own writer, editor, and publisher. The world of writing is about to change. Papyrus Author, the word processor for authors, has arrived on the international stage. Unrivaled in its scope, it is the first software suite to unite every single step of creative writing. The vision behind Papyrus Author is to empower everyone with an idea to turn it into a great book for free. A word processing core that matured for over 10 years at its foundation, Papyrus Author goes beyond the text with its intuitive organizing layers for story, characters, notes, and research. The powerful style and readability analysis help raise manuscript quality. The inbuilt publication capabilities take the book directly to the reader with eBooks, DocX, and print-ready PDF. Visit papyrusauthor.com to get started today. Well, that that brings up a great um, uh, topic that I'd love to ask you about because there's there's uh, this argument and arguments that not the right word, but um, there's a discussion that happens between writers about writing to market and writing what what the uh, what the buying public wants to read. And holding on to your perceived integrity to write what and, and, and maybe integrity is not the right word, but but yeah. writing what you're passionate about, what the, the thing that 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 CJ really has a desire in her heart to write versus writing what the, a certain agent or editor or publisher thinks that will sell. Um, you know, how do you make those decisions? about you know drawing the line this is this is a stand i will take this is a compromise i i won't make um you know and and you know because you've made these decisions how how do you how do you weigh out the options and and draw the line where you will and won't compromise it's interesting actually because either side of it whether you're an unpublished um writer or you know you're a published writer um you, you still come up against those decisions as, as an unpublished writer when you're desperately just trying to get the attention of an agent. Um, I think it can be tempting sometimes to think, oh, maybe I should just write something. This seems pop. Maybe I should just try and write something like that. Um, but very quickly, you know, I have found out since I've kind of been in the industry, as it were, that, you know, that there's no point trying to do that because what is popular right now was something that was signed maybe two years ago. Right. And, agents and publishers won't be looking for that right now. They'll be looking for something different. So I don't think you can, unless you're a very quick writer, perhaps, I don't think you can write to the market in that way. And I think I think very quickly, I think agents and editors can see through stuff that is, is just written like that, if there's no heart to it. Um, and I think actually they're always looking for something different. It might not seem like that sometimes, but I think they are always looking for something different, something that's that's unique, that's, you know, they haven't seen before. And I think, you know, you, you have to kind of stick to your guns a little bit. It can be hard when you've had goodness knows how many rejections to think, oh, maybe, you know, what I'm writing. And I was told at one point, this 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 agent told me that my kind of mix of thriller and, and horror was not publishable, wasn't publishable. Wow. Um, and, and I was a bit like... I hope nobody tells Stephen King that. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I, I think <laughs> I've got one person who writes it very, very, you know, very well and is, you know, yeah. is Stephen King, you know. Um, but I, I kind of, it was what I loved. And I, I, I found I couldn't not kind of write what I wanted to write. Um, and then, then, you know, I think fashions and publishing changed perhaps. And by the time I came to write and submit The Chalk Man, it was a different market. And I'd used that time by kind of, I guess, getting better as a writer as well. I think I did improve as a writer between that age and, and the time I wrote The Chalk Man. So no writing time is wasted in a way. I used it kind of wisely to hopefully improve. Um, and by the time I submitted the chalk man, the market was more open to that kind of genre that I was writing. Um, but of course, once you're published, there becomes that little bit of a battle as well, I guess. I'm just gonna have a drink so I don't cough, excuse me. <laughs> so CJ, um you uh, <laughs> because you you have a couple of uh, desk drawer novels, as we call them, or trunk novels, where um you know you attempted to sell and 
and uh, and and those didn't make it to market. But then when you started writing the Chalk Man, did you know that there was something different about this manuscript? Did it feel different to you? Um, you know, were was it just like all the others? You know, this this feels good to me. We'll see if anyone wants it. You know, uh, did did you know in the in the creation of it that this one was going to be different? Um, not really. No, <laughs> I thought I thought That's it was good. a good idea. I liked the idea, and it enabled me to do something which I'd wanted to do, which was to kind of have this kind of. Um, I'd, I'd wanted to write something in the eighties because it was very much my teenage years, um, and this idea Ooh, yeah. of this chalk game. Um, that takes a sinister turn, these chalk figures kind of appearing on their own in this, this small English village. It just seemed like it was a really nice thing to hook it on. And I, and I really wanted to write something in the UK that was kind of homage to all the stuff I loved as a teenager in the 80s. So a big homage to Stephen King, to all those films that I loved, like The Goonies and The Lost Boys, the stuff that kind of informed my childhood. And it seemed like a really good vehicle to sort of do all of that with. And so I had a lot of fun writing it. And I really enjoyed writing it. Um, and but I still didn't think that necessarily it would go any further than perhaps other things that I'd written um, because I'd been rejected a lot by that point. So I never liked to think, oh, God, this could be the one. But, you know, I, I liked it and, and I sent it off with, you know, some hope behind it. But I think actually at that point I had decided if it, I didn't get anywhere with this manuscript that I might well put it all to bed for a while. Because by that point I was running my dog walking business and I, I was a mum. I had a two year old daughter. So I was very busy and I didn't have a lot of time for the writing. So, you know, at some point something has to give. It was a bit like, you know, I can't really juggle all of this. So let's see what happens with this one. And perhaps we'll just, you know, say we had a good shot, but, you know, it's not meant to be. Um, but fortunately it was meant to be, which was great. But no, I, I was fully expecting that, you know, at every stage, even once I got the age of this wonderful, lovely age of you kept telling me, you know, how much you're going to love it. Um, I still kept thinking, I'm sure they're all going to reject it. I, I, I just couldn't let myself get my hopes up. So, you know, every bit that we got a bit further was was a wonderful surprise. CJ, I'm fascinated by the the beginnings of things. Um, and th- there's something about that first moment when when a book becomes alive in your mind. And there's a there's a kernel of a uh, of an idea that then blossoms and grows and forms into this fully formed 400 page novel that we have in front of us um and and you talked to, uh, about the chalk man and kind of what the genesis of that story is um th- then you went on to to publish the taking of Annie Thorne and your the book that we're here talking about today is the other people and the other people it has a fascinating open to this book um i i completely put myself right in the characters, in, in the driver's seat, you know, with him as the book opens. But what was the genesis of this book, of the other people? What was that kernel of an idea that grew into this? Well, well the other people starts with the main character, Gabe, being in his car, driving along the motorway, stuck in traffic. Right. Like coming back from work. Um, and he's sat behind this same car in this slow-moving traffic, this kind of beaten-up old car with all these stickers around the rear window. And as he's staring at this this car, he sees this little girl's face appear in the rear window. And he realises he knows her. And she mouths one word, which is daddy, before the traffic starts to speed up and takes off. And and he's just seen his own little girl in the back of this strange car in front of him, where she couldn't, shouldn't possibly be. Um, And that's the premise which, which, you know, the book starts with. Um, And, yeah, I mean, it started pretty much with me in a similar circumstance. (laughs) Because I was, um, we were, my, when we, um, we, we moved recently, my family and I, from the north to the south of England, because all our family are in the south. So we used to spend a lot of time driving up and down the motorway to visit our family and a lot of time stuck in traffic jams. <laughs> that's the thing. Um, and yet we were driving back one, one night um, and I was driving and I'm, we were sat in slow moving traffic and I had been sat behind this same car, very similar, this really beaten up old car with all these stickers around the rear window. And as you do in that circumstance, you kind of stare at it and I'm reading these stickers and thinking, God, how long have I been sat behind this car and crawling <laughs> traffic? And then my mind started to wander, as it does, I think. And I, I sort of think, what would be really weird right now is if like a face appeared in the, in the rear window of that car in front of me. And and then what would I do if it was the face of somebody who was, I don't know, looked like they were in trouble 
What if they were like banging on the window or something and they were being kidnapped or something in this strange car in front? And I thought, that's that's not a bad idea for a, a story of some sort. But then my mind started going further and I thought, what if what if I was sat here you know, on my own and I saw the face of a child? What if I saw the face of my own little girl in the rear window of this car in front and I knew she shouldn't, she couldn't be there? And and it, it just suddenly seemed like, A, a really chilling idea, yeah. a chilling thing to happen, and just such a really good start for a book. And I, I think I went, I, we got home that night, and I think I, I wrote down the first chapter the next day. Um, it was initially called The Car in Front. That was sort of the working title for a while um, until sort of the, the, the strands of the story developed. Um, and then it, it, it sort of merged with other ideas that I had going on that all became one thing, and it became the other people. But that was the kickoff for it. I love that. I love that. And and I think we all have seen a car like that. And yeah. you, you, you immediately, your mind starts running because the, you, you do a great job of, of uh, illustrating the, the sort of schizophrenic nature of the stickers or how they're, they're diametrically opposed sometimes, you know, real men love Jesus, honk if you're horny, you know, like what, <laughs> you know? and aggression and, and sort of weirdness yes was, yes i like that did so the 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 other people i mean <laughs> you you don't uh kind of bury the lead there um there's this organization called the other people and um did 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 you have the idea for this group um or did the uh did the idea for the the random stickers like when did these two intersect because um you get this uneasy feeling about the car and then you, you know, then you start to realize, okay, that, you know, this makes sense. Um, where did these two storylines kind of converge? Um, there were, there were a couple of things I'd been thinking of. I mean, I, I, I'm a mum, and my little girl is now, when I wrote the book, my little girl would have been the same age as the protagonist's sure. daughter, which was five. And obviously when you're a parent, you know, the most terrifying thing that you can think of is obviously losing your child in any circumstances um but occasionally you know i think you know you, you have these horrible dark terrifying thoughts um but i think that as parents you know we, otherwise you would live your life in such a state of perpetual terror you kind of have this denial that you know the terrible things you hear happening sometimes or you read about or you see on the news happen to other families those awful things happen to other people it will never happen to my family, to my child, to my loved ones. And I think you have to kind of have that denial. Otherwise, you know, you, you just you wouldn't go anywhere. You'd live your life in a bubble. You'd never go out the door. Um, and I'd had this, this idea for a while about this idea of happen, bad things only ever happen to other people. Um, and then I started thinking about, you know, about the lengths you would go to if, if something terrible happened to someone you love. And I think particularly when it's a child, there, there are pretty much no lengths perhaps you might go to if pushed to avenge or to, to get justice for your child. And, and those ideas started to all merge together. So the idea of the, the, the lost daughter, bad things happening to other people. And then the other people started to take form as this group um, in my head. What if there was this group that, that offered justice to people, grieving families who had lost loved ones, who perhaps felt they hadn't got justice in the traditional way? Um, and again, that idea of what would a parent or a family member do to, to get justice. And I thought, you know what, I think, yeah, there, there, there are plenty who would go that to that length to, to, to get that justice. So that's, that's how the group of the other people, this shadowy group who, who offer this sort of form, form of justice to um, people who have lost loved ones came about. CJ, I've gotten to know quite a, a few uh, crime, thriller, horror writers um, in, in doing this show. and. Um, and they are some of the most lovely people and usually people with a fantastic sense of humor. And, um, you know, sitting here talking to you and just seeing you laugh and smile, um, just um, it, it just just joy just, uh, you know, emanates from you. And, and then you read some of the things you write and you go, oh, my gosh, CJ has to be a horrible human being um, <laughs> to come <laughs> to come up with some of this stuff. But why do you think that we relatively well-adjusted, happy people love to read about the darker things in life? What is it that fascinates us about these kinds of stories? Um, 
it's odd, isn't it? Perhaps I think I sometimes think it's a safe way to experience bad stuff. Yeah. You know, in a, whether it's a film or within the pages of a book. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's something about, you know, kind of in, not, not indulging, but perhaps confronting dark thoughts and fears that you can do safely within the confines of fiction. As a writer, obviously, I write out some of my scariest fears, as, you know, as I've said, you know, a lot of it is to do with family and um, my own little girl. And I think, you know, you put some of that onto the page and you confront it in that way. Um, and I think you could do that as a reader as well. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's, there are certain things I... I don't read though, which which you know there, there are certain things to do with I think children and motherhood I I, I find difficult to read. One of my favourite books used to be We Need to Talk About Kevin. I haven't reread that book since I've had my own daughter because I think I would come at it with a very different perspective. Yes, yeah. and I might find it more difficult and perhaps even perhaps harder to identify with the narrator and so on. So I think you know our own sort of lives and what's going on in our lives sort of informs our reading quite a lot as well. But I mean, certainly as I write, I, I do think about things that, yeah, are, are my fears, are my worries, or sometimes just my what are the worst that could happen sort of things, or what if moments. I think most books start with a what if moment that often happens from a real life situation. Right. Well, in the other people, Gabe is a fascinating character uh, because, you know, a few years after this incident that he witnesses literally on page one of the book. Um, it it begins. Um, he has not given up. Uh, you know, years later, and will not um, believe that his daughter is dead. And uh, this this causes conflict with other people in the book. And and y- you think about it. Um, there comes a point where people want to process this this bad thing that's happened. And not that that uh, it, it, and it's understandable that. Um, uh, not that you that you want to dismiss what happened, or, but people need to to process this bad thing and and be able to move along in life. Not not to forget what happened. Not to you know. But there, there's a process. There's a grieving process that has to go on. And and at some point, people um, want to compartmentalize it in some way. Uh, but Gabe refuses to. Um, yeah. it, tell me about the, the creation of Gabe in your mind and what, what drives him to be this way and, and how does his determination and his belief that, that he can find his daughter, what does that do to the other relationships in his life? Well, he, yeah, I mean, he, he very much becomes a man. I think I describe him as eaten up by hope. Right. <laughs> that's a, that's a great description, by the way. Cause I think that hope. It can be the worst thing, you know, I think. And there's a difference between when someone is missing to when knowing they are dead. I mean, even though all the evidence might point to the fact that Gabe's daughter is no longer alive, he he can't let go of that sighting. He can't let go of that sliver, that tiny sliver of hope that she might somehow still be out there. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of parents can relate to. You know, even if you, you know it's almost impossible, there's the tiniest bit of hope there. You can't let go of it. And, and, and that's almost worse because you can't let go. Therefore, you, you can't get Not that you ever, ever get over losing a child or a loved one. Right, right. But you are unable to, as you say, compartmentalize, unable to move on from that because that, that hope just dangles there, almost taunting you. And I think that's what it is with Gabe. And so he, he, he does. He kind of abandons everything. He's, he, you know, he leaves his house. He basically sells everything. He just spends his whole life driving up and down the motorways, believing somehow that he will one day find that that car that took his daughter, that, that something that will prove that he was right and perhaps set him on the track to at least discovering if she's alive or what really happened. Um, and, and yeah, and, that, and that's become his obsession. And I think that very much is perhaps the only thing that keeps Gabe alive, really. I think that's the only thing that keeps him going within the book that that drives his his whole existence to find out for himself what happened to his daughter and and I kind of felt that very keenly I kind of felt Gabe as as myself in some ways I very much put myself in in his shoes as to how I would feel and what I would do and I could completely understand that obsession with with wanting to know what had happened to his daughter to the the exclusion of everything else that's the the only thing that, that matters in his life so he is this very lost and very lonely and very obsessive character um, at the start of the book. 
Um, but I, I, I found that interesting. And I also found it very interesting to write somebody who isn't really tethered to anything, because normally we all have our lives, which are tethered with our homes, our, our jobs, you know, our routines. And he's somebody who has abandoned all of that to basically live out of his camper van, driving up and down the motorway. And the closest thing he has to any kind of permanence is, is the, the rest stops, the service stations he visits on his treks up and down the motorway. Um, and I found that quite interesting to write this character who, who was constantly kind of in motion on the road. Um, and I also find um, service stations, which I think you can sort of refer to as rest stops in the US. Um, in the UK, we call them service stations. Um, quite odd places as well, because again, they're full of transitory people. Nobody wants to go to a service station. You know, it's, right. it's not a destination you choose to go to, these, these horrible artificial places where you just stop for, a, you know, for the toilet or to have a snack or a drink or whatever. Um, but, you know, full of these people who are just in motion or on their way somewhere else. Um, and I, I found that interesting to play with as well. So it was, it was sort of a, a p- putting myself into Gabe's shoes very much. or I could really feel his journey all the time. And and we're not going to spoil what happens uh, to Gabe and his uh, <laughs> his run ins with uh, the other people. We'll we'll leave that for you to read for yourself and you'll thoroughly enjoy it. Um, CJ, I know that you have a new book coming out in just a couple of months. Uh, the Burning Girls. Is that yeah. right? Yes. Out in, in February in the US next year. Yes. So can can you give us a glimpse into what we can expect from there? What's the what, what's the the setup for it? If you can share that. Right. So, um, yes, basically, it's set in a, a small village in the south of the UK called Chapel Croft. Um, and basically, the, the sort of the blurb is that um, 500 years ago, eight Protestant martyrs were burnt to death in the village. 30 years ago, two teenage girls disappeared without a trace. And two months ago, the previous vicar of the parish committed suicide. And now a new vicar. Reverend Jack Brooks, um, who is a single parent with a teenage daughter, has moved to the village to take over the parish, um, but very quickly finds strange messages left, an old exorcism kit with a scripture basically saying whatever is hidden shall be known and revealed, and other dark messages, these strange little twig dolls called burning girls, uh, which the villagers leave um, as a sort of a memorial. Every year they hold this um, ceremony which commemorates the burning of the martyrs with these strange little dolls, which are set fire to called burning girls. Um, So these strange messages start being left for Jack. He very quickly finds that there's um, a lot going on with this village, a lot tied up with the history that's sort of still happening in the present day um, and a lot of secrets to be revealed. So I I described it as very much a kind of like a very much a a Wicker Man-esque type of Gothic mystery. Um, because I, I wanted to play with something like that. So it's, yeah, it's very dark, it's very creepy, lots of twists and turns um, and lots of surprises, hopefully, too. But again, it was a, it was a book that sprang from the fact that uh, a couple of years ago, my family and I moved from north to south to a very small village in the Sussex countryside. <laughs> and um, one of the first things I noticed about when we were driving to where we now live was this very strange, odd and creepy looking chapel up on the main road into the village. And the minute I saw it, there's a book in that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is now the book, basically. And um, yeah, and a lot of history in the book is based on real life history of the area. A lot of small villages in the UK have a very dark and gruesome and odd history. So it, it sort of was using some of that history um, in the book. It was, it, it was fascinating. So it was, it was yeah, that's, that's the new book that's out next year. So um, I'm hoping people enjoy it. There's something wonderful about seeing, um, you know, a centuries old little chapel. Some people look at that and get encouraged and they see a place of comfort and a place that has, uh, you know, that people for centuries have found refuge and solace and connected with their better spiritual selves. And then the other ones of us see that and just know that there's a horror story there. (laughs) (laughs) A lot about people's character, doesn't it? Which way you go there? (laughs) That's right. That's right. I can't wait to read the new book when it comes out. Um, CJ, we're going to put links in the show notes uh, to the other people and your other books to make it easy for people to find 
Um, but if people are fascinated with your story and all the great stuff that you're doing, where can they connect with you online? Um, I am on Instagram. I am mostly on Twitter, actually. Um, I have Facebook page as well, uh, at CJ Tudor Official. And I'm at CJ Tudor Author on Instagram and just at CJ Tudor on Twitter. Um, and Twitter is the one I kind of populate the most. So if you want to chat, that's where I'll get back to you right away. <laughs> Excellent. We'll be sure to put links there so people can find that easily. CJ, this has been so much fun talking today. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And I, and I do apologize about the slightly croaky snuffles today. But at least you can't catch anything <laughs> online, you know? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Do you ever wonder if a person's critical thinking comes at the expense of their own happiness? Is it possible to be very happy and still practice excellent discernment? I used to wonder the same thing. Then I discovered the Trouble in Paradise podcast with Nigel Kent and Jasmine Starr, where they laugh as well as think about conspiracy theories and unexplained phenomena without ever getting bogged down in the age-old tug-of-war between logic and feeling. The Trouble in Paradise podcast is a joyful program for critical thinkers who have a sense of humor. Join Nigel and Jasmine as they probe the intriguing and wacky culture of odd occurrences, strange news, and ridiculous coincidences on this hilariously intelligent podcast. Trouble in Paradise on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Stitcher. Follow at TipCast239 on Twitter. Trouble in Paradise with Nigel Ken and Jasmine Starr, a happy podcast for critical thinkers like you.